Hi everyone, my name is Isabel Ringrose. I'm a member of the Socialist Workers' Party and a journalist on Socialist Worker. I'll be chairing the session uh, Gramsci and the Art of Revolution. Our speaker today is Alex Kalinikos. Alex is a member of the Central Committee of the Socialist Workers' Party. He's also a columnist in Socialist Worker and the author of a new book, The Age of C uh, Catastrophe, that you can get in uh, Bookmark's bookshop. So the way the um, session is going to work today, Alex is going to speak for about 30, 35 minutes on the topic, and then we're going to have plenty of time for questions and contributions and debate and discussion. And the way that we're going to run the debate um, is through speaker slips. So if you uh, can see a member um, in a pink team, sorry, pink team top uh, with speaker slips, there's a member waving them at the back there. Um, if you'd like to make a contribution, just... Um, get the attention um, of a team member and then fill in the speaker slip briefly with what you'd like to uh, speak on, hand it back to a member of the team um, and then we'll be calling people up that way. Please feel free to start um, filling these in and handing them in while Alex is speaking as well as during the discussion so that we can fit in as many people as possible. Um, and we'll go into that a bit more um, when the time comes. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Alex to kick off the session. Thanks very much and hello everyone. Now Gramsci has become an absolutely massive cultural icon. I mean almost as well known uh, as Marx quoted or referred to continually even by sometimes quite sort of bourgeois figures. Um, and um, the idea that he developed a theory of uh, cultural hegemony has become a kind of intellectual cliche, even though it's not particularly accurate. It doesn't really capture what uh, Gramsci was was on about. Um, but I think it's it's important to reclaim Gramsci for the revolutionary tradition. He's not someone who can who should just be cut and pasted you know, chat gpt would and so on these days. Um, he um, is, if, if you look at the Marxism of the 20th century, there are th three people to go to if you want to understand revolution. Lenin, of course, the leader of the great revolution of October 1917, Leon Trotsky, his co-leader, and Gramsci. And Gramsci was the one of the three who was able most systematically to reflect on what revolution involves. Lenin didn't have time, he died, you know, compared to someone like me, young, um, in, the th in the thick of uh, the revolutionary struggle. Trotsky had more time than Lenin, but he, um, he was, his life was, the last years of his life were dominated by the struggle against the Stalinist bureaucracy. Gramsci had his own form of enforced leisure for the last slightly more than 10 years of his life. He was in, in a fascist prison, and that gave him the time to think about revolution as part, as I'm going to try and bring out, of think, trying to understand what had gone wrong in Italy, why the fascists had, had come to power. And the result was his prison notebooks. Um, D detailed, often retranscribed and uh, slightly re revised notes that he, he compiled, um, particularly in the early part of his, um, his imprisonment because he became increasingly ill until his death in, death in 1937. Um, they're a very rich source of theoretical, historical, and political understanding, although they're notes, you know, they're not a finished analysis, and there's much debate about how he's, in particular, how he was used by the Italian Communist Party uh, after the Second World War to legitimise their essentially reformist policies, but that's not what I want to talk, talk about today. I, as I've already said, he was trying to make sense of a very specific uh, revolutionary and counter-revolutionary experience, that that of Italy from the Italy's inter intervention in the First World War, which I think was in I should have checked I think it was in 19, 
1915, but was extremely bloody and disastrous. Per capita, more people, more Italians died fighting in the First World War than, for example, people in, in Britain did. It was a br very bloody and terrible experience. As elsewhere in Europe, it had a radicalizing effect. And at the end of the, the First World War, you had what was called as the Bienio Rosso, the red two years between 1918 and 1920, when you had a whole series of workers' revolts, of uh, mass struggles of different, different sorts. It's important to emphasize not just in the um, towns, not just in the cities, the great industrial centers like Turin, where Gramsci for during this period was based, but also in the countryside, uh, mass movements of farm laborers and so on. And this period of struggle reaches its climax in September 1920, when the employers provoke uh, a mass occupation of the factories um, by the industrial working class concentrated in, in northern, northern Italy. So this was a moment of potentially revolutionary confrontation. The problem was that the leadership of the Italian working class movement, um, both of the Socialist Party of the trade union, were, from a revolutionary point of view, completely useless. Completely useless. They were reformists in their substance. That's what they really stood for. But um, they used an abstract revolutionary rhetoric, which actually simply obscured and confused the situation rather than helping. And ultimately, the factory occupations were defeated by the um, very crafty liberal prime minister of the day, G Gilotti. And in the wake of that, you have a real dramatic turn in the si situation, the beginnings of a counter-revolutionary offensive where a ruling class of industrialists, bankers, landowners, and so on, who have been terrified by this upsurge of working class struggle and seek to crush it and take revenge. And their instrument for do, doing this became the fascist movement. I'd, there's a meeting on fascism going on at the present time, and I don't have time to talk about it here, but the fascists emerge as thug, as um, gangs of thugs, often recruited from former frontline fighters in the trenches during the First World War, who are mobilized, in particular, initially in the countryside, to crush the militant agricultural laborers uh, organizations. If you've ever seen Novo Cento, 1900, the great film by Bernardo Bertolucci, it shows very well that happening in the um, in the Po Valley in central North North Italy, and um, the, there's it leads to a very dramatic reversal from fantastic workers' uh, upsurge to um, the f fascists increasingly crushing any sign of working class activity. There's a new book by John Foote, uh, the son of our, our great comrade Paul Foote, called, uh, I think it's called Blood and Power, which is about fascism in Italy. And he brings out very well how there's this sudden reversal from this very uh, militant uh, and self-confident workers' movement to working class activists and socialist politicians being hunted down, persecuted, beaten up, killed, and so on by the fascist counteroffensive, of course, supported by the authorities and so, so on and so forth. There's a good book by one of Gramsci's uh, comrades in Turin, a guy called Tasca, called The Rise of Italian Fascism, which shows in detail how this process of counter-revolution went on until the march on Rome, wasn't really a march, but anyway, in October, 1922, which brought Mussolini to power, that which brought the fascists to, to power. And Tasca, too, e emphasizes how useless the uh, working class leaders were and how much they took refuge in an abstract and rhetorical Marxism. And this is the context in which Gramsci uh, emerges as one of the leaders of the new uh, Communist Party of Italy, which breaks away as a result of the betrayals of the reformist leaders, um, as the revolutionary wing 
of the Italian working class movement as part more broadly of the communist inter, inter, international. But the initial leadership of the communist party is dominated by a man called Amadeo Bordiga, who was in, in many ways a very uh, sophisticated and uh, effective both intellectual and organizer, but his Marxism was shared some of the abstractness, the mechanical nature of the um, the leadership, the traditional leadership of the Italian working class movement. So he said there wasn't really a difference between uh, the kind of liberal politicians who hitherto dominated Italy and the fascists, which was a bit of a mistake, really. There's a film actually about Gramsci and Bordiga uh, in both imprisoned by the fascists, sharing um, uh, their uh, sharing work, working together in quite an amicable way in prison after they'd been uh, arrested by the fascists. Uh, before that had happened, Gramsci became uh, the leader of the Italian Communist Party, displacing Bordiga. But the kind of context that I've tried to sketch um, shapes key features of, of Gramsci's Marxism. And I want to go through some of those features. The first of all is really summed up by something that Lenin said, and Gramsci very much sees himself as drawing the lessons from the experience of Lenin and the Bolsheviks. Lenin said that the concrete analysis of a concrete situation is the soul of Marxism. And this is partly what I was trying to convey when I suggested that this meeting is called the art, Gramsci and the Art of Revolution. And art is necessarily a creative process. There's not a set of rules that you can follow to make a to create an artwork uh, or to or to make a make a revolution. It's a creative process. You have to address the specific features of the situation you confront and work out a way of finding, you know, tracing a path to, to revolution through it. Gramsci was very good, good, at, good at that. Um, and one of the things that distinguishes his writing is an attempt to address the specificities of Italian history and Italian society. For example, in an essay called The Southern Question, which he wrote, not long before he was imprisoned in 1926. And the Southern Question, in the Southern Question, he's addressing the fact that Italy in his day, and to some extent even now, was divided between an industrialized, modernized capitalist North and the South, which in those days was still dominated by massive latifundia, landed estates, uh, where the, the peasants who worked on them were profoundly oppressed and exploited by the, uh, by the landowners. And Gramsci said that this bifurcation, this division of Italy's social geography, Gramsci himself came from the south, from Sardinia, um, reflected the nature of the Risorgimento, which was essentially Italy's bourgeois revolution, which takes place in the mid 19th century, which wasn't the kind of didn't involve the kind of revolutionary process from below that we see above all is the French Revolution, the Jacobins leading the small producers of town and country to destroy the old regime, execute the king and so on and so forth. Um, rather, you have essentially a deal between the northern capitalists who want unification in a modern Italian state and the landowners of the south. This is what Gramsci came to call passive revolution, not a revolution from below, but a revolution from above, manipulated and controlled. And what that leads to is the continuing oppression um, and deep subordination of the peasantry in the South, while the Northern working class is partially incorporated in the modern Italian state through various economic concessions. And he, Gramsci says this was a historic mistake by the early Italian socialist movement. The Italian, the, what the socialists in Italy should have done was to build a revolutionary alliance between the workers and the peasants to smash both capitalism, but also the landlords of the, the, um, of the site. <laughs> Secondly, 
there's the philosophy of praxis. This was how Gramsci described, or if you like, redescribed Marxism. Now, he didn't uh, coin the phrase. It was coined by an early Italian Marxist, a very interesting figure called Antonio Labriola. And both Labriola and Gramsci used that way of describing Marxism to, dis to, to differentiate themselves from the dominant way in which Marxism was understood both um, in Italy, but more broadly in the, the, the second international, the international socialist movement of the day. And what the dominant view articulated most powerfully by Karl Kautsky, the chief theoretician of the German Social Democratic Party, they conceived revolution as a kind of natural evolutionary process. Revolution, Kautsky would say, would, will happen of natural necessity through the working out of the economic laws of history. Gramsci, following Labriola, rejected that. He translated into Italian or retranslated um, Marx's thesis on Feuerbach, and in particular seized on the phrase that Marx uses there of revolutionizing practi practice. In other words, revolution isn't uh, an objective uh, kind of natural process like something that happens in, in nature outside us. Um, it rather revolution is something where human, what Marx himself called human practical life activity is, is central. And this is expressed in Gramsci's, um, this definition that, Mark, uh, that uh, Gramsci gives of Marxism. He says, the philosophy of praxis does not aim at the peaceful resolution of ex existing contradictions in history and in society, but is the very theory of these contradictions. It is not the instrument of government of the dominant groups in order to gain the consent and exercise hegemony over the subaltern classes. It is the expression of these subaltern classes who want to educate themselves in the art of government and who have, in, have an interest in knowing all truths, even the most unpleasant ones, and in, and in avoiding the impossible deceptions of the upper class and even more their own and i think that's a brilliant way of putting it marxism is a theory of contradiction it's an instrument of the exploited classes and it's a way of overcoming not just the deceptions of the ruling classes but the way in which we, we can deceive ourselves because of course that's a very important way in which people are kept subordinated not just by the lies of the ruling class but by the lies that people tell themselves in order to get through from from day to day to day so this is how gramsci understands marxism now this brings me to the question of hegemony which is at the heart of gramsci's conception of revolution now the first thing i want to say about this sometimes gramsci is presented as rejecting marx's fundamental idea that um social formations uh, arise from and depend on what Marx calls the real foundation, which is provided by the uh, forces and relations of production. This isn't true at all. Gramsci studied Marx's capital very seriously. He was one of the very few Marxists of his day to have a really in-depth understanding of Marx's theory of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, which is Marx's, the core of Marx's theory of, of crises. But Gramsci insisted that these economic contradictions didn't automatically lead to revolution. So, you know, he describes the contradictions involved in the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. And he says how these contradictions will be resolved will depend on political practice. There's no, there's no neutral or objective way in which they will be resolved. And there's another passage, which I don't think I can read all of, but which um, I just want to read some of to get a sense, give you a sense of what he's arguing. He says, a crisis occurs, sometimes lasting for decades. 
this exceptional duration means that incurable structural contradictions have revealed themselves or reached maturity and that despite this the political forces which are struggling positively to preserve and defend the existing structure itself are making every effort to cure them within certain limits and to overcome them um there's a lot more that could be said but i think it's very important two two important things to take from that passage which is one of the most important in his writings one is that you can have the explosion of structural contradictions but that explosion can produce a very protracted crisis that's important because we're living through what has been a protracted crisis of capitalism which is its origins really in the in the 1970s Se secondly there's the idea that once again just because these contradictions emerge the system doesn't collapse but rather the political forces trying to defend the state status quo seek to manage the crisis and at least partially to to overcome it and Gramsci elsewhere argues that one way that fascism couldn't just be seen as thuggery and making people drink castor oil and beating them up and things like that it wasn't simply repressive but it was an attempt to restructure uh, Italian capitalism through much more state control and in that way overcome or at least limit the crisis tendencies that were going on so what's the lesson of that don't think that because the society is in crisis that the ruling class are just going to wring their hands and let things fall apart they will act to reshape things in their favor and we can obviously think of ways in which, which that's true of the uh, of the present now uh sorry how much more have I got Isabel 15 minutes oh that's plenty good okay um right so and clearly you know when Gramsci develops this analysis he has the Bienio Rosso the red two years and the other revolutionary experiences at the end of the first world war for example in it's uh in uh, germany and so so on and so forth in mind you have this huge explosion mass workers struggles but the ruling class manage in the end to hold things together and he then takes marx's distinction between base and superstructure he doesn't contrary to the misinterpreters reject it but he he kind of re re-engineers it and he said he distinguishes in particular between the economic base in the sense of the forces and relations of production and what he calls the superstructures you know in other words there there's a complex set of different institutions which arise from the economic base and help to keep capitalism going and in this is where hegemony comes in because Gramsci says that the ruling class is dominant not simply through economic power or coercive power but also through what he calls moral and intellectual leadership through the grip that they have on the minds of those whom they exploit and this is the core of his theory of hegemony and there's a story not from Italy or Germany but from Britain at this time that sums it up in 19 for, for me that sums it up this his point up in 1920 the TUC general council decided to call a general strike um and you know this is a, a moment when society is very polarized and the massive workers struggles the police have been on strike all you know there's still there's a war going on in Ireland all sorts of things so Lloyd George the prime minister calls them in calls in the TUC general council and he says gentlemen because of course there were no women there um gentlemen if you call your general strike you will be taking control of the country you will be coming the government of the country and one of the people there was a man called Bob Smiley who was the leader of the Scottish miners union and he said I think it was to Nairin Bevan the great Labour left-wing leader uh, later on he said when I heard those words I knew we were lost because essentially Lloyd George was saying this is a struggle for political power 
you're starting on. Are you up for it? And of course they weren't, and they called off the general strike. That's an example of hegemony, the way in which even the leaders of the exploited internalize the ideology of the ruling class, the idea that, you know, there's a constitutional system of government, that you have to respect the rules of the game, all, all that sort of nonsense. You know, think of Keir Starmer, you know, all the God save the king stuff. I mean, you couldn't, I mean, you couldn't make it up. So the super, superstructures are where hegemony is, uh, Established either established and maintained or challenged and, and uh, overthrown. And Gramsci says dis distinguishes between what he calls civil and political society. Civil society are what are at least nominally private institutions or autonomous institutions. They're not technically usually part of the state, but they essentially function to help to maintain hegemony schools, universities, churches, political parties, trade unions. There, this complex web of institutions helps to maintain ruling class hegemony. Then there's also political society, and political society is the repressive core of the state. You know, what Marxists call the repressive state apparatus, like those bastard cops who shot the uh the young lad in france the other other day and it's very important that gramsci sees um hegemony operating through both civil society and and political society people sometimes say he sees hegemony as something cultural it's just to do with ideas not true at all he talks about hegemony armored by coercion you know, in other words, ideological domination and physical coercive domination are closely integrated with each other, and they work together in all sorts of work, all sorts of ways. The uh, passage that I quoted, the second passage I quoted, comes from a famous, well, one of the most important notes in in the prison notebooks, which is called the analysis of situations, and he uh, identifies different levels of analysis, starting, of course, from the economic base, then civil and political society, but the third level is that of the military and coercion, he says. And this, of course, partly reflects the experience of the First, First World War and the, the kind of violence that unfolded within Italian society and in other societies as well, particularly Germany and its borders, at the end of the... Um, at the end of the uh, first first world war so he doesn't leave out of the picture the um the existent the the way in which the repressive state apparatuses interweave with the um with the institutions of civil society it's together that they maintain hegemony and they have to be challenged uh to to together so the the operative conclusion for this is that revolution has to undermine the hegemony of the ruling class and to develop the beginnings of an alternative proletarian hegemony and this brings me to the last um theme that i want to raise that's the theme of the modern prince um one of the um one segment of gramsci's notebooks is called the modern prince now what are princes doing here? One of Gramsci's reference points is Machiavelli, whose most famous work is called The Prince, which is all about how to get and hang on to power, putting it simplistically. So, um, and it's always a bit ambiguous in Machiavelli who the prince is. Is it an actual prince or is it, as in the case of the Florentine Republic that Machiavelli defended, is it the people in some sense? Anyway, with Gramsci, it's absolutely clear. The modern prince is the revolutionary party. The party that he had tried to build in Italy at the end of the uh, First, First World War. Um, so that the, what the revolutionary party is, is a key instrument in breaking the hegemony of the ruling class. Now, that doesn't mean 
um, I don't know, infiltrating the institutions of civil pol and political so so society or something, something like that. It means practicing the class struggle, sometimes in those institutions, actually, if we think of the struggles in universities at the present time and so on, so on and so forth. Practicing the class struggle, but practicing the class struggle in a way that breaks down or undermines the hegemony of the ruling class. So the, the 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 single part of Gramsci that in the SWP we've most we most quote is a wonderful passage where he says, "I'm uh, I'm oversimplifying because he uses um, a language." One of the things he has to do in the prison notebooks is to conceal <coughs> that he's discussing the class struggle and smashing capitalism from his jailers. Anyway, but what he says is that the, the typical worker has a contradictory consciousness. It, elements of that consciousness uh, reflect the worker's practice as part of a collective socialized process of production with other, other workers. That points towards communism, towards a, a self-managed society controlled by workers. But then there are the elements that come from the influence of the ruling class and its in institutions. And that may go back, yeah, 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 may go back a very long way. In another passage, he says, you know, people believing in astrological columns and things like that. That's that's a Stone Age. Those are elements of Stone Age color consciousness that still persist in people's heads. But the crucial thing is the struggle between the elements of communism in people's consciousness, in workers' consciousness, and the elements that come from the ruling class. And you can imagine what they are. Nationalism, patriotism, sexism, all that, all that kind of rubbish. And in a way, that, so, People sometimes say, you know, Leninists want to just put ideas in workers' heads. Gramsci says, no, that's not it at all. What we're trying to do is by participating in struggle with workers and building common institutions of struggle with them, we're trying to shift the balance in workers' heads away from the reactionary ideas that come from the institutions of civil and political society and towards the communist ideas that are implicit in workers workers practice so the revolutionary party you know isn't isn't a savior it's uh it's some it's it's a it's a, it's an element um a constituent of the kind of struggles that workers are taking part in, but one that seeks to push those struggles in a particular direction, a direction which isn't just to do with the struggle winning or losing, although of course that's very, very important, but is to do with the development of a kind of consciousness that undermines the hegemony of the ruling class and begins to encourage workers to see themselves as the rulers of society, themselves as the ruling class, the managers of a different kind of democratic and self-organized com communist, uh, communist society. So I'm going to finish now, but the way I put it is this really, that, that uh, Gramsci's starting points, you know, his rethinking of Marxism, his attempt to th think it through as a philosophy of praxis, are much broader theoretically and historically than on the whole you find in Lenin and Trotsky. But the finishing point is the same, the Revolutionary Party. Fantastic. Thank you so much to Alex. Um, before we kick off the discussion, I'm going to ask if comrades can turn to the people uh, next to them and around them for two to three minutes of discussion just to see what um, you thought of the meeting and, and to share ideas and then we'll bring it back. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I know everyone's got lots to talk about and hopefully we can reflect that in the discussion um, and there'll be plenty of time throughout the day to keep chatting and discussing ideas. Um, 
So now we're going to bring it back, oh, well, you know, to the main discussion. Um, I'm going to call people up two at a time so that you know um, you're going to be speaking. And there'll be a mic going round. Um, the team will have a mic, so they'll come to you. Um, you'll have three minutes to make a contribution. After two minutes, I'll tap the microphone quite loudly so that you know you've got one minute left. Um, and then you, I'll tell you to sum up after three minutes. Um, so the first speaker we've got is Phil Turner. Um, give us a wave, Phil. Yeah. Phil's here, and Phil will be followed by Geraldine um, Mirabile. Uh, right. Um, yeah, quite a few years ago, I helped um, a performance of a play called Occupations by the shockingly neglected Marxist uh, playwright, Trevor Griffiths. And uh, uh, really, the, the, the play was part of his response in the early 70s to the collapse of the French Revolution and the disastrous role of the Communist Party. But he actually uh, placed the, 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 the setting for the play in the period of 1920, uh, hence the title Occupations. And uh, unusually, uh, Gramsci is one of the characters, one of two characters. Um, Griffiths plays a little bit fast and loose with the sort of historical accuracy, but it creates two figures. And really, a, it's about a debate between the kind of mechanical um, uh, organization that Alex uh, mentioned and, and what um, the character of Gramsci argues, which is really about being in the thick and thrust of the debate and argument. So that it, it's, um, you know, it's, it's an argument about party and class, about leadership, about revolutionary organization. And, and of course, um, Gramsci was it, it, totally convinced after the defeat of um, uh, the, the workers in, in Italy, in Turin and elsewhere, and, and then which led to the rise of uh, Mussolini and fascism, was totally convinced of the need for party organization in the way that uh, Alex has uh, outlined. But the point I wanted to make is that really, what the play captures, and what I think is the essence of what I've read about Gramsci, is it, it's the living, breathing arguments, the day-to-day -day cut and thrust in, in, involved in workers' struggles, which is so important. And it's not a, some kind of uh, abstracted intellectual exercise, which unfortunately, because uh, of the distortions of Gramsci, that has in, in some circles become the norm. So what I wanted to, to say was really, when he talks about we're all philosophers, what he means, I think, is we can all play a part in bringing this rotten system down, and we have to take up the fight and bring the two things together. Yes, it's hard to think about those ways to make uh, 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 the revolution and art but at the same time you know we have to be clear about that we have to get our hands mucky etc and uh, the last thing I want to say is I know some people do find Gramsci difficult and it's not helped because of the obscurity of the, the language because of the prison no notebooks having been written in prison under censorship etc but I would urge people to not give up on Gramsci and to stick with it and in fact I'd say any new people in the room to come to your local SDBP branch meetings and discuss uh, political ideas, Gramsci and many, many others. But also, but better still, join the SDBP and then come to the meetings and then we can bring theory and practice together. Just before Geraldine comes in, um, we've got two questions, one from Max, one from Santiago. I'm not sure who you are. Um, as they're questions, I can either just read them out or we can put them in the queue. Um, read them out. Okay, cool. Um, well, I'll bring Geraldine in, um, and then Geraldine will be followed by Riyad Akbar, and I'll then read the questions out. Thank you, Isabel, and thank you, Alex. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a great meeting, and I'm here. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know if you can see me. Um, but thank you as well for like for bringing up the uh, questione meridionale or southern question, because as a Sicilian, um, I grew up with this. Uh, heavy weight of feeling very much diverse and <laughs> compared to the to, to the rest of Italy. And this became such a big topic for Gramsci. And I want to, sorry, I have to translate it. I'm not a great translator, but I want to really, because it's such a great passage from one of, one of his articles in the Ordine Nuovo. Um, Gramsci said, the Northern bourgeoisie has treated the, the South and the islands like colonies of exploitation. And the working class from the North, emancipating themselves from the 
capitalist slavery will emancipate the South. So this to me is so important and it's been so powerful to remember when, you know, sometimes uh, you you don't want to say the, that you are Sicilian because it's still um, feeling quite discriminatory when you say, oh, I'm Sicilian. Oh, OK, mafia. Uh, OK, uh, thanks. Um, so thanks for bringing this up. And thank you for talking about Gramsci. Thank you. Oh, do you want me to read it? Yeah. OK, great. Um, Alex, um, if uh, Trotsky and Grams, Gramsci, oh, sorry, if Trotsky, well, I'm not doing the meeting. If Trotsky and Gramsci are key theorists um, of revolution in the 20th century, can you talk about the impact of Gramsci outside the global north in the 20th century? Um, and I'll read another one as well for you. Um, this is from Santiago. Um, what's your opinion about the Ernesto Laclaus interpretation of Gramsci and, and Hegemony? <laughs> Yeah, thanks everyone. Okay, <laughs> right. We'll bring in John Parrington, followed by Andrea from Sardinia. Yeah, I'm, I'm John Parrington from Oxford University, and I'm very interested in what Alex said about Gramsci's theory of contradictory consciousness, because I have a big interest in consciousness, human consciousness as a biologist, and you sometimes get the feeling when you hear, you know, neuroscientists and people talking about human consciousness, it's just like a kind of, the brain's like a fixed thing with a kind of wiring, hard wiring, uh, you know, it's not going to be that easy for it to change. And I think obviously as Marxists, we see very much the idea that ideas can change, but we also recognize there is a huge contradiction because as Marx said, on the one hand, the ideas in society, the ideas of the running class largely, but clearly in struggle, whether it's, you know, a strike or even more when it starts to go into something like revolution, there's a huge potential change in people's ideas. But I think Gramsci really adds this by, by talking about the contradiction within this. So even within a massive struggle or revolution, there's still, it can often be very backward kind of ex ideas existing with the most kind of progressive ideas about the possibility of a future society. And I think as a biologist, what's really exciting about what we're learning about the way the brain works is it really kind of fits with this kind of dynamic aspect but also the contradictory aspect so far from the brain being this kind of fixed thing we're starting to learn that it's an incredibly plastic uh, thing it's not it's not the, the neurons are not all fixed there's potential for new neurons new connections and that really fits with the idea that new experiences can really change um the way people think but we also realize there's a really complex dynamic going on between different parts of the brain and and certainly what's exciting about stuff that for instance Earl Miller's doing in MIT in, in the United States is showing that there's a real biological basis to a dynamic aspect to the brain it showed that different uh, brain waves of different frequencies can kind of con interlink different parts of the brain in a very dynamic way and it helps to also explain the kind of contradictions there so I ain't got time to go into it but you know I think some what Freud said about the unconscious is key to all this people can have all sorts of ideas coexisting partly because some of these are co uh, unconscious but also there's what we've learned from another thinker Vygotsky is the importance of language the importance of language with instruction and thoughts and that also means that there's a dialogue going on in the mind and if people intervene intervening in that dialogue he says revolution is doing the workforce actually makes a massive difference so we can't just blindly expect that you know experience itself like a strike itself taking part in a revolution in itself will lead to a change in ideas for the better it's also about revolutions having this very active uh, input and, and arguing things through and you know really challenging some of those un unconscious ideas and i think that's why you know biology completely backs up what we as Marx is saying. I think, you know, Gramsci was only one of the people who helped develop our concepts on, on this question. Thank you. It was a fantastic talk. Thank you for that. And being from Sardinia, I shared the birthplace of Gramsci. So I'm really very proud of that. Reading recent letters, you show how much he loved where he came from. So for me, it's very, you know, important and personal a bit. So my question was, how did Gramsci think that the cultural and economic divide could be bridged between the the north and the south and for, for for the working class to be brought together to a revolutionary path if you could elaborate on that but thank you just before i bring in sean we've got another question from max um alex how do you think gramsci would react to maloney's fdi and neo-fascist italy um can I also encourage um, people who are speaking uh, to stand up when they're making a contribution? Because uh, I think we're all looking around the room for each other. So yeah, just stand when you're speaking. Thank you very much. And Sean will be followed by Maxine Bowler. Uh, thanks, comrades. Um, 
what I want to do is, is to give you a little anecdote of how our tradition uh, as a revolutionary party um, has had to constantly repudiate the distortions of Gramsci. Alex's talk uh, this afternoon is, if you like, the most contemporary, the most recent uh, and very clear uh, exposition of that repudiation. But it is something that we've had to do for as long as I've been a member of the party, and that's going back 50 years. And the anecdote relates very directly to where we are now. Just across the road from here is the Institute of Education where I was studying uh, for an MA, uh, and the uh, leader of the course, Professor Harold Rosen, uh, Mike Rosen's dad, some of you may know, um, had left the Communist Party in 1956, but had not followed the Euro-Communist tradition of distorting Gramsci. He was still a socialist. Uh, he knew what my politics were. He wasn't uh, a Trotskyist. He was a bit how shall I put it, uh, dismissive of these young Turks who are coming along and stealing the thunder of the old communists. But he did say to me, I want you to do a presentation on Gramsci uh, to the MA group who were all, uh, how shall I put it, liberal lefties and weddy uh, to the Euro communist view. And I found uh, a pamphlet that had been written by Chris Harmon called uh, Gramsci versus reformism, I think was the title of it. Um, and I, if you like, I uh, educated myself to uh, encapsulate uh, what our tradition was and what our response was. And I remember one sentence of it, uh, uh, it goes something like this. He said, how can you possibly try to take away the revolutionary core of Gramsci when he was the editor of a revolutionary paper, Lord Nainuevo? that he was imprisoned by the fascists for 10 years, as Alex has already pointed out, and that he was the author of the Leon thesis, which was a manifesto uh, for uh, revolution and the need for a revolutionary party. So I just want to end by saying that what we are doing this afternoon is part of a long tradition of the repudiating uh, those distortions of Gramsci, and it's a tradition of which we should be rightly proud and that we should, as uh, Alex said, put Gramsci on the pedestal uh, of revolutionary tradition uh, in the 20th century alongside Lenin and Trotsky. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I uh, also have found Gramsci to be quite difficult. And I think partially that is because um, my understanding is that when he wrote uh, the prison notebooks, quite a lot of it was kind of coded to get past the prison censor and therefore it has been kind of open to misinterpretation really. Um, and I suppose I want to say that I believe that uh, he was right, that revolution is an art um, and I, I suppose in terms of ideology, I think it's quite important. I can't remember who said it, but somebody said we have many hard hands and they need to be ruled by force, fraud or goodwill. And part of what I think uh, Gramsci's talking about is the ideology that is used to hold us and bind us uh, to the uh, uh, system. And sometimes people say that we're that people are brainwashed by uh, capitalism or by the media. And I, I think that's wrong. Um, I, I think it is about the ideological glue that holds us uh, to the system and that um, human consciousness. I think uh, last night when we saw the fantastic rally that took place and you saw people standing up and fighting back, you knew there was a real chance. And those people involved in those struggles know that they actually have a greater power than they ever thought they had. And I think that's partially because they are in the process of the struggle, starting to chuck off the muck of uh, ages, all the uh, rubbish ideas they're told uh, they should uh, believe in. I suppose also, I think that the reality of capitalism is it obscured from us quite often. I mean, I was thinking about the way in which we've been uh, fed the constant story about the uh, five rich men who went down in the sub, wiping off the news, the 500 refugees who drowned uh, in, in the ocean. And that's because they want to make us focus on the five rich men, not on the 500 people. And our job as individuals is to try 
try and expose the reality of capitalism. And that is an art, I think, because you have to think about how you are going to expose these things. And I was thinking also, finally, that actually we had uh, a number of people who were in our tradition who worked in the mining industry in the in the in the 1980s in the big uh, 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 confrontation that took place with the miners and actually they as individuals made a difference they made a difference in terms of winning people to an argument to take action and that's really uh, an art you have to learn by engaging in the class struggle by talking to people about how to move them forward and I think that that is part of what Gramsci was trying to uh, talk about. Hello, yeah, Hello. Hi. I'm Dion, uh, I studied Chinese politics so my qu question might be kind of informed by that. Um, my question it's actually I only have a quite two kind of interrelated questions and they're on the the revolutionary party as an instrument to carry out revolution. Um, so w one question is how do how does Gramsci reflect or do you reflect on um, how do we make sure that the party actually um, represents the desires and needs of the people or the proletariat and that it does not devolve into um, a power mechanism itself um, and the, the second question is is practically related after a revolution, the party takes power, as for example happened in China. How do you make sure that the party itself does not only sustain its own maintenance, but actually keeps representing what it stood for in the past? And does Gramsci reflect on that apparent paradox of a revolutionary party itself? Thank you. Thank you. Um... Pierre will be followed by Jessica Walsh, and unfortunately, Jessica will be our last speaker, just so that we can give Alex enough time to sum up. So really sorry to those um, who didn't get a chance to speak, but we've got a whole weekend of festivities where hopefully uh, the discussion can carry on. So um, Pierre and then Jessica, please. Um, so I just had a question. I think I wrote it down on slip, but I can just ask it. So if Gramsci thinks that um, capitalism runs into crisis that become manageable and so if that the capitalists become to try to ride it and try to manage the crisis is there a risk that anti-capitalist forces become just managed by the capitalist themselves as part of the crisis or is that something that's sort of is there a way to prevent that from happening uh thanks so much thanks so much alex um i like very much your phrase um talking about marxism as like an art of contradictions and and, and a philosophy of praxis because i think gramsci kind of encapsulates you know a contradictory and kind of dialectical approach to approach to a lot of this and i think you see this in the way that he talks about hegemony and the way it's maintained as um as a combination and an interplay of both coercion um uh coercion by the you know the political sphere like you talked about the armed you know what lenin would call the armed bodies of um special armed bodies of men but also consent um, the cultural and ideological sphere, which uh, which 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 they work together, they they're both relied upon and they interplay upon each other. It's not it's not that one is more important. They both they both act uh, they both act together, and you see that uh, to maintain the rule of the capitalist class, and you kind of see that, you know, you see this all the time, don't you? You see the way the media attacks like uh, climate campaigners, while at the same time the state is criminalizing them even further, and, and you know the the media is like undermining their support constantly, and the way these things, you know, they 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 work together to kind of to to maintain the maintain that uh to maintain that hegemony and the idea of con contradictory consciousness which i think is so so valuable for us isn't it because um you know i think people be can become quite hopeless when they think about you know the marxist idea of the ruling ideas in society or their ideas of the ruling class that it's unchallengeable that the working class is just forever going to be one to to kind of backwards ideas that they're just fed from the top fed from the media but what contradictory consciousness shows us that is that you know workers can have two two things in their heads can't they they can have for instance you know the the result of struggle the 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 experiences of struggle you know there might be a good trade unionist who will never ever cross a picket line um who, who's had experience of struggle but at the same time you know thinks we should have a royal family or uh, thinks we need to limit the amount of immigration that we have so, and really the kind of the interplay of those two things is actually to be hopeful and uh, um um talk, it's about the subjective element isn't it and 
the, the, the contradictions that are in if that exist in in people's heads there there's there to be one but there's also the obviously the the crisis ridden society that we live in is so full of contradictions and it's open-ended and that means that our activity matters and the, and and what we do as revolutionaries matter and actively engaging in struggle alongside workers we can intervene and expand the good sense in people's heads that we work with through experience and struggle and that's why the you know the importance of the revolutionary party isn't it in breaking down uh breaking down those bad <laughs> the, sorry good sorry which one's the bad one common sense ideas in workers heads but also um looking down to break down that hegemony which kind of operates uh operates in both spheres as well right Thank you so much to everyone uh, for your contributions and sorry again for those who didn't get to speak but like i said there'll be plenty of sessions to come back to just before i bring alex back i've got a couple of announcements the first um that the session with noam chomsky tonight at 6 30 has been moved into the beverage hall um the beverage hall can be found in senate house just past the ticket desk and bookmarks bookshop um, we're also delighted that Soweto Kinch, the award-winning saxophonist and MC, will be performing at Mully's Bar tonight after the last session where we can continue uh, the discussions. Um, I'd also um, like everyone to at least check out uh, Bookmark's Bookshop at least once, um, where you can get books about Gramsci, you can get Alex's book, uh, The New Age of Catastrophe, and lots of other literature that's going to be really important to take away. And the final announcement is that if you're here for the next session um, in half an hour's time, please can you leave and then come back in uh you know for fairness and for accessibility as well um that's all from me i will now hand over to alex to sum up that brilliant discussion okay thanks a lot and thanks everyone for a really great discussion and i'm not going to comment on or respond to all the contributions lots of really great points made independently just on um what uh, um Phil, Phil referred to Trevor Griffith's play Occupations about, about Gramsci, and it's, uh, it was nice he hearing that because it, was, it was put on in the early 1970s and it reflected a, a moment when one revolutionary generation was reflecting back on the experience of an earlier generation. There is it actually, I remember there was a TV version uh, so I'm going to go and on YouTube to see if I can disinter it because it it would be really worth. It's a it's a real political debate between Gramsci and the representative of the Comintern, and actually Griffiths had a debate with Tom Nan, who was one of the people who introduced Gramsci to the British left about how historically accurate the play was. Anyway, that's a bit of self indulgence. The distortions of Gramsci are very, very important, particularly in the 1970s when the Italian Communist Party and those influenced it by it, like the right wing of the Communist Party here in Britain, used a distorted version of Gramsci to justify their essential abandonment of even the pretense of a relationship to the revolutionary tradition. And I think we have to pay tribute to um, Sean's and my old friend and comrade Chris Harmon, who played a very important role in going back to the original of Gramsci and showing how he'd been distorted by the, the Euro communists, as they were known. Um, someone asked about Ernesto Laclau, who was an Ar Argentinian Marxist and then post Marxist. And with his partner, Chantal Mouffe, they wrote a book called Hegemony and so socialist strategy they were part of that current but um i wouldn't say they were distorters of gramsci because they were more honest they said there are good things in gramsci <laughs> we like the theory of hegemony which they interpreted much more in terms of uh much more in cultural than in uh, po political terms but the problem with gramsci is this classism you know, he keeps on going on about the working class and the bourgeoisie and the class struggle. What we've got to do is get rid of all that stuff and then we can kind of float float free. At least that was honest. You know, it made it clear that to exploit Gramsci from a reformist point of view, you had to break with him. Um, now, it's very interesting, the cluster of, of comments and questions about the Southern question in Italy. I think... Um, 
Um, and I'll, I'll avoid sort of cultural commentary about the contemporary north-south divide in Italy, but I agree with Geraldine, it's very kind of visible in all sorts of ways. But I, I think um, one of the things Gramsci, I didn't talk about it, but Gramsci tends to emphasize the differences in revolutionary strategy between the West, the advanced capitalist countries of Europe, like Britain and Germany and Italy, and the East, meaning in particular Russia and the experience of the Russian Revolution. And, and I think in uh, that wasn't Gramsci at his best, although it's really famous. And Chris, Chris Harmon criticizes him in, in his uh, defense of Gramsci against the Euro communists, which you can find easily on, you know, if you look uh, on the, uh, if you follow it from International Socialist German Journal on the, on the web. And one reason why it's not very good is because Italy wasn't a typical advanced capitalist society. In a certain way, it was much more like Russia. Um, a, a society experiencing what Trotsky calls uneven and combined development, industrialization in the north, the persistence of quasi-feudal landlordism in the in the in the south, but within the borders of the same the the the, the, the same state. And as Gramsci his, himself says, you know, there's a colonial. Uh, Geraldine quoted him. There's a colonial relationship really between between North, North and South. I mean, there are complications one would want to make, make about that, particularly the role of Southern intellectuals in, in Italy, people like Benedetto Croce and Gramsci himself. But nevertheless, it's very interesting because, and some people have pointed since, uh, for example, this is something that the great uh, Palestinian um, uh, writer and critic Edward Said emphasized this means that Gramsci is, is you know in a way is, is he's thinking about a society which is much more like societies in in the south than the supposedly more advanced parts of, of Western Europe this makes him usable uh, by people who want to carry out revolution in, in the in the south um, unfortunately the influence of of Stalinism on many uh, left-wing movements in the the global south have limited Gramsci's influence but there is a story that I mean one of the great Marxists in the south was Maria Tegui the great uh, Peruvian Marxist of the interwar period he visited uh, Europe in the early 1920s and according to some people he he met uh, met Gramsci and certainly the spirit of Maria Tegui's Marxism is very much that of the philosophy of praxis not a kind of mechanical kind kind of Marxism how did Gramsci see overcoming the north-south divide well it goes back to something that he spells out both in the um uh, the uh, southern question but also in the Lyon theses that that I think Sean referred to which was the program for the communist party that he developed not long before he was arrested he, it's absolutely essential for the uh working class in the north if it is to be a genuinely revolutionary class to build a revolutionary alliance with the peasantry to have a program of overthrowing the landowners of getting resources to the peasantry that can begin to overcome the appalling poverty and uh, that they they suffer from and so on so it's Gramsci's answer is in a political program uh, a revolutionary alliance between workers and and peasants very he's very much influenced by the what what the Bolsheviks did in Russia the alliance they built with the peasantry to uh destroy the provisional government and carry through the revolution but clearly this is a strategy that as much that continues to have relevance in the south okay last last point is a, there were a couple of dangers that uh two two speakers referred to first of all Pierre I think you were saying, isn't there a danger if the capitalists are trying to cure the contradictions, as, as Gramsci puts it, that they'll 
they'll try and incorporate the anti-capitalists. And that's true, that is a real, a real risk. Uh, not that they're going to abolish capitalism, but they project themselves ideologically as anti-capitalists. Again, this is true of fascists. You know, fascists present themselves as anti-capitalists. Both Mussolini and Hitler did. I mean, at the same time, they, you know, they told the bosses, we're on your side, we'll smash the working class and so on. They spoke with very forked tongues in, indeed. But it, um, and we, but we begin to see this at the present time. I mean, someone referred to Maloney. I mean, I don't think Gramsci would have had much of a conversation with Maloney, you know, just, you know, from through the barrel of his revolver, but if he had one at the, in the right, so, oh, sorry, I should stop, stop this now before the police come and arrest me for some breaking one of their new public order laws. Um, but, um, but, you know, she talks, the anti-capitalist talk a certain amount. She was attacking the European Central Bank at the, at the present time. That's why it's very important that the, the fascists are challenged not by liberals who are essentially complicit with the contemporary capitalist status quo, but by revolutionaries who have a genuinely anti-capitalist critique and program. And then Dion asked about, you know, can we, in a way you were saying, can we trust a revolutionary party not to betray the, the revolution? And the short answer to that is, you can't simply trust anyone in politics. It's a sad, sad truth. Um, what you can do is you can build a revolutionary party that is based on comradeship and commitment to the revolutionary struggle. That can get you a long way, as we see with people like Trotsky and Victor Serge, all the people who've been part of the Russian Revolution and continue to fight against its degeneration under, under Stalin. But that, to, to work in the long term, long term, that has to be wedded to a working class that is self-organized and in power. In other words, the kind of revolution that we're talking about, but it's also what Trotsky and Marx and Gramsci and so on were fighting for as well, is a revolution that is made by the working class and where it's the working class that takes power, not the revolutionary party. In China, it was the communist party that took power on behalf of the people, on behalf of the workers and peasants, but with power, and in particular guns, firmly in the hands of the communist party. That's not our kind of, kind of revolution. Can we be sure it would work? It'll work. You know, as Lenin said, you commit yourself and then you see. But the first step towards achieving that revolution is to build a strong and rooted revolutionary party. So in a Gramscian spirit, I would appeal to all of you who haven't yet become part of the modern prince to, be to become so as quickly as possible.